Welcome, folks, to Uncovering Potential Value Within International Developed Market Equities. I'm your host, Jeff Benjamin, Wealth Management Editor at ETF.com, and I'm joined by Matt Hammer, Head of Investment Product Management at John Hancock Investment Management, Joshua Jones, Portfolio Manager at Boston Partners, and Paul Heathwood, Head of North American Investor Relations and Distribution at Boston Partners. Welcome, gentlemen. International developed market equities have lagged their U.S. counterparts for much of recent history. Though global macroeconomic risks continue to challenge markets, we're anticipating a rotation toward equities, especially international value stocks. Kicking things off, Matt, can you provide our audience with an overview of John Hancock Investment Management? Sure, Jeff. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who is um, listening today. So what you see on the screen is really what our main value proposition from an investment strategy perspective is. And, and our belief at John Hancock Investment Management is that there are expertise um, amongst many managers globally. Um, you know, I, in my role, I work with a lot of advisors. I've seen a lot of um, portfolios and very rarely do I see um, those portfolios managed by only one asset manager. And that kind of open architecture platform is what we bring um, in all our investment strategies to you and your clients. What we're trying to do is bring that multi-manager, those boutique and, and sometimes larger scale asset managers um, that are more institutional in nature to you and your clients at a retail level. You see the, the asset classes on the screen here and you see the multitude of, of firms that we work with. So, so we're looking um, at firms that are, are quite large. Um, that are multinational down to extremely boutique managers that are, are very specialized, that are surgeons, if you will, in their specific craft of investing. And we believe that that's just simply a better way to invest. And that's what we bring to your clients. You also see at the bottom that we're not only manager agnostic and we're trying to find the best of the best for you and your clients, but we're also vehicle agnostic. So um, mutual funds, um, separately managed accounts, um, you know, asset allocation model portfolios, um, a robust private asset business, um, 529 CITs. And then what we're going to talk about today, which is ETFs, which is a, a business that we've been growing um, over the last few years. So, Jeff, I think, you know, that kind of sums up what our major value proposition is, um, is bringing that multi-manager approach to our advisor clients and their end investors. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Thank you. Now, we all know that ETFs are the fastest growing area in wealth management right now. Obviously, financial advisors love them. Can you, Matt, walk us through Han John Hancock's evolution into the ETF space? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we started this journey, um, you know, back in 2015 um, with our partners at Dimensional Fund Advisors. Y you know, we wanted to bring to ETF landscape that exact same philosophy, multi-manager finding the best of the best. Um, you see that we, you know, we have a pretty robust lineup as we stand today, um, just launching um, a, a strategy in the high yield space earlier this year. Um, so we have a, a really robust fix income lineup made up of some core strategies, but also some strategies that can be bolted on to, to, to core allocations um, within U.S. equities, really core within, you know, with dimensional, as I mentioned, from a multi-factor perspective, um, dividend, et cetera, and, and an all cap strategy, as well as international. So what we want to do is provide our clients with, with kind of the, the best opportunities from a core strategy perspective across fixed income and global equities. And ultimately that brings brings us to, to what we're going to talk about today. You see at the top of that international equity section, um, which is our partners at Boston Partners. And, you know, I would just take a, you know, 30 seconds or a minute here and talk about our partnership. So I talked about, you know, specialized expertise. That's what you're going to get from Boston Partners. This is a world-class institutional um, asset manager. They manage all of their strategies with one process, and that's through a value lens. And I know Paul and Josh are going to touch on that, so I won't steal their thunder. But what we really wanted to do was bring um, an, this 
international strategy to you all in an ETF wrapper, which we believe is a great complement to some of the other wrappers that we have um, worked with Boston Partners on. So, so Jeff, an evolution that's lasted, you know, just about 10 years here, um, all active ETFs. And we believe that that we've provided um, our advisors and our clients a great platform to be able to use that specialized expertise, um, not only from a vehicle perspective, but also from an asset management perspective. Okay. Thanks, Matt. It's helpful to have an understanding of the partnership between John Hancock and Boston Partners. Shifting gears a little bit here, Paul, can you give us a brief overview of Boston Partners? Absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks for that intro, uh, Matt. So Boston Partners, you can think of us as an investment firm. We focus on stock picking as the source of return in all of our portfolios. And that stock picking is supported by bottom-up fundamental analysis that we do uh, one at a time. Uh, the firm has been around since 1995, and we utilize one investment process. As Matt mentioned, it's a value-oriented process where we also incorporate the concept of strong business fundamentals, as well as positive business momentum. And Josh will talk about more about this in some detail. But I think the key takeaway there is that it's the same process for everything that we do. And every person at the organization uh, really lines up behind that process. And it leads to, we think, uh, better execution uh, for, for our customers. Um, you can see we run about $103 billion in assets. Uh, we have offices based in Boston, but we're also in New York, California, and London, where Josh is based. Uh, we have a global perspective to the capital markets, uh, and we've been doing that for over 20 years. And we've been managing assets in international since 2008, uh, including about $6 billion in a uh, combination of mutual funds, separately managed accounts, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, so that gives you a sense of Boston Partners uh, from the organizational perspective, the individuals responsible for running the assets are, you can see here on the, on the screen. Uh, let me introduce Josh Jones. He's portfolio manager uh, for our international capabilities. Uh, his responsibilities include security selection, portfolio construction, risk management, and he and his team are the ultimate ones responsible for investment performance. Uh, Josh's story is very indicative of Boston Partners in that we believe in homegrown talent. He spent almost the entirety of his career with Boston Partners beginning as an analyst. Uh, so really learning our process and philosophy from the, from the ground up and as a practitioner. Uh, he's advanced in his career to manage a portfolio as he's doing now. And uh, again, this is a key element for, for what we do. I think it's also important that if you look at the, the broad team of uh, research analysts that we have supporting uh, Josh and his efforts, 23 uh, fundamental analysts, eight quantitative analysts. Uh, and again, each one of these analysts have a global perspective. Uh, many of the analysts are organized by industry sector. They focus on the entire globe. And then we have some uh, specialized analysts that focus on uh, non-US developed markets. Uh, so four analysts uh, there uh, uncovering individual ideas uh, that will, will enter into the portfolio. So I think the key takeaway with uh, the team is homegrown talent. People have spent uh, very long periods of time here focusing on one process. That means a lot of continuity in the people and a lot of consistency in how we execute the strategy. Okay, good stuff, thank you. Josh, let's uh, check in from London. Uh, given the stellar performance of the S&P 500 this year, which is up nearly 12% so far, why are we even talking about international value right now? Yeah, and thanks, Jeff, for having me on today. <clears throat> so I think we think about it in, in just kind of a multidimensional sense. So, um, you know, I, at Boston Partners, we you know pride ourselves on being very analytical and, and, and just understanding the data and what's driving kind of the outcomes in markets. Uh, obviously, from our perspective, through value and, and fundamentals and momentum. Um, and so, you know, just generally speaking, there's obvious benefits to just diversification in your portfolio for having exposure to international equities. But as you alluded to, um, just that kind of statement alone has been, you know, maybe a, a painful experience for investors over the last 10 years as the S&P has just been so powerful. Um, but if, if you kind of dig into it, 
you know, what I would generally say is, you know, your starting point from a valuation perspective um, matters. Um, but as I'll get to, it's not just valuations that matter. And that's generally always been the case for international equities. On average, they've always been a little bit cheaper than, than the U.S. market. Um, but really importantly, it's just the intersection of, of, of value and fundamentals. Um, and that's ultimately what really drives the outcome, because as we all know, it's, it's not just the price you pay for securities. Um, it's underlying earnings growth, returns on capital. So it's really kind of the intersection of the two. Um, and so when we've studied it, you go back to 2010, 2011, um, you know, that was a period that was post the, the financial crisis. Uh, the dollar was actually statistically quite cheap then. It was hated. So it was very contrarian. Um, the S&P was a very cheap market and it has been and was at the time still very high quality. Um, so, you know, if your entry point at that point was valuations in the U.S. market were good and fundamentals were great, that was a, a winning combination, if you will, up until today. Um, and you, you, so if you look at the data today and you kind of analyze that same starting point, um, I, you know, fundamentals of the S&P market are still really good. There's, there's no arguing against that, but valuations are more expensive. Um, and what's happened internationally is that because capitals left that market to chase the U.S. market, valuations on average are a little bit more attractive than they have been historically. And maybe more importantly, when you look at the data, um, we're just seeing a pretty substantial improvement, in just the fundamentals of kind of the value opportunity set, if you will. And, and I would kind of, it's quite nuanced, but you know, you know, one of the things that we do at Boston Partners is we have a team of quantitative analysts. They analyze a lot of factor inputs. Um, and so we, we try to kind of measure quality, if you will, over time. Um, and you look at the usual discounts you have to quality in the non-U.S. markets you, relative to the U.S. market, um, and it's actually closed. And so I think what the model and what we're seeing in the data that we're picking up is just, you know, in a simple sense, a lot of these businesses that, that, that constitute kind of your typical value subset, so energy, um, materials, financials, um, a lot of them have lagged for 10 years, and that's put a lot of pressure on the management teams to basically improve capital allocation. So you're seeing better decisions by the management teams in terms of returning capital to shareholders, making wiser, uh, more calculated decisions about how they invest. And on the margin, that's improved fundamentals. So it's just it's created a nice little opportunity set where not only do you have stocks that are cheaper than average, um, but they're seeing improving fundamentals. And, and that's re really set up for just a generally a better opportunity set um, for the non-US markets going forward. Um, and then lastly, I, you know, I would comment on the dollar. Um, you know, just generally speaking, there's, there's obvious diversification benefits from getting some you know, non-correlated returns. And some of that comes through uh, taking non-dollar exposure. Um, the, you know, the investments that, that we're taking in the international markets, you're getting local returns plus FX back to US dollars. Um, and so, if, again, if you go back to 2010, 2011, uh, the dollar was cheap back then. And uh, because of strong uh, economic growth in the U.S. market, it's appreciated rapidly. What, you know, right. by some measures, um, and we've looked at kind of, current, you know, real rate differentials, um, you could argue the dollar is about as expensive today as it was cheap in 2010 or 2011. Um, and this is really because this, you know, the Fed has had to raise interest rates so much to just slow the U.S. economy down. Um, that it's it, that's you know created a real rate differential that's advantageous to the dollar and created uh, a situation where it's more expensive. So I like to think that at least from a headwind standpoint, um, you know you've probably seen a lot of the worst of it, but you know these are hard markets to, to predict. Um, but if we were to see weakness in the dollar, uh, you know over the next five or ten years, that that would obviously add some return benefits to the non-U.S. markets. Josh, can you give us a sense? I mean, you you laid the foundation pretty well for where, where you see there, that there is a lot of value and opportunity out there. But can you give us a sense of what the investment process looks like from your end? Yeah. So at Boston Partners, it's it's twofold. I mean, we're ultimately fundamental value investors, um, but we start with a quantitative uh, input process. So we have a team of eight quantitative analysts. They've built and maintained a proprietary quant model for Boston Partners. Um, and really what we're doing is we're modeling a lot of different factors that ultimately lead to um, scoring each stock in the universe from a valuation, from a fundamental perspective and a momentum perspective, because it's the intersection of all three of those uh, factors, if you will, is what we think ultimately drives alpha. Um, and it's really what we want to incorporate in our portfolio. So we've defined it as our three circles investment process. 
it's trying to find stocks that intersect all three of these, these elements. Um, our general take is that value is quantifiable um, and, and to some degree momentum is very quantifiable. And, and really, you can have a really strong team of fundamental analysts, but if the analysts are just simply looking in the wrong place, um, the odds are stacked against you in the sense of probability. So uh, the idea with a quant model is it really kind of tells us where there are opportunities in the market. Um, in some sense, it's, it's even better telling you where there's likely to be failure. So what part of the market to just not spend time looking at? Um, but once we start with that quantitative model and kind of whittle the universe down to, to stocks that look uh, attractive from these three circles. Um, from there, our analysts will, will dig in and do uh, you know, very thorough fundamental due diligence on the businesses uh, that we're ultimately going to invest in. Um, and that is just you know, understanding the companies, meeting with the management team, uh, you know, and formulating an investment thesis around the, the business, how it, you know, the economics of the company, um, and their perspective on its you know, intrinsic valuation and underlying business momentum. And so at that point, the assessment of business momentum is a qualitative judgment. Um, I think about it as a derivative of fundamentals. Is the business getting better, staying the same, or getting worse? Um, in, in a simple sense, a good business where things are getting worse on the margin can be a very destructive investment. Um, and inversely, uh, a business that's having you know, troubles fundamentally where things on the margin are getting better and improving actually can be quite productive. So it's that kind of marginal sense of fundamentals uh, that we're trying to kind of qual qualitatively assess in momentum at that point that's important. And when we can really answer all three of those, so business fundamentals, business momentum, and, and intrinsic value of, of the business, uh, you know, that's ultimately what's driving the investment decision as to the stocks that will ultimately make it in our portfolio. I would highlight, you know, just some nuances in the context of that, you know, is, is probably many, uh, you know, individuals would appreciate there's, and at least from our perspective, there's rarely a perfect three circle stock, um, you know, value and momentum are competing factors. Uh, so the way I think about it is typically the larger positions in our portfolios are, are higher quality companies. Um, but they have, you know, an element of, of intrinsic value, but they're not necessarily the cheapest stocks in our portfolio. And then sometimes the smaller ones are, are stocks that are really cheap, with a lot of upside, but they might just be higher risk reward that where momentum is, uh, you know, we're anticipating that it improves. Uh, but ultimately, you know, if we can create a portfolio of companies that have these characteristics, um, you know, we're, we're, we're highly hopeful that, that over time, that's an, an alpha winning strategy. Okay. Um, all right, sticky. Obviously, we're looking international here and uh, getting companies into that Venn diagram. What what is driving the opportunities that you're seeing in the markets, the international markets today, with companies that fit all three of those circles or a piece of those circles? Yeah. So there's a few there's a few um, kind of segments of the market that I would highlight that are opportunities today. Um, you know, at first, I do think there's a reasonable opportunity set in some of maybe the real asset or commodity related industries. So this is energy um, and it's metals and mining. Uh, and really what we're seeing there is, um, you know, if you just kind of look back over the last 10 to 15 years, there was originally a big commodity boom in the, the 2000s that was interrupted by the GFC and then it kind of continued to 2015 and then really broke down as China slowed down. Um, and what that's done is it, it's created a pretty significant retrenchment in capital spending. Um, so the one thing that's, in some sense, it's hard to analyze the commodity markets, but what is easy to analyze is the capital spending patterns of those companies. And typically when their level of capital investment, you know, the, the amount that they're spending on new projects declines rapidly, um, it just sets up for reduced supply in the future. And so we've really seen that reduced supply since about 2015 or 2016. So in the post uh, pandemic era, you know, as demand has recovered, um, we're seeing shortages in a lot of these markets. So this is energy um, and, 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 and it's a lot of the metals and mining space, you know, it's copper. Um, and, and so those trends are quite productive in the sense that the management teams are still generally not spending a lot. They're harvesting free cash flow, they're paying it back to shareholders. Um, so the opportunities in energy look great. Um, copper, we're really excited about, you know, one of the nice things about the international market is, is, is more of the big kind of opportunities within metals and mining tend to be non-US companies. They're London listed, they're Canadian listed, Australian listed. Um, and one of the things that we've looked at 
Um, and it seems to be, a, you know, caught more attention in just the last three or three or four months. But you could kind of see this brewing for a multi-year period. Um, is that just an inability for the industry to go copper supply? Um, and when you look at the copper markets, um, you know, just going back to some estimates in 2022, um, you know, the, some of the some of the, in, the the groups that put together kind of supply and demand models were projecting relatively large deficits out into the mid 2030s just because of electrification trends. So, um, and when and, and when you you look at those those demand trends. Uh, it just implies kind of better copper prices going forward. Uh, and so we like some of the opportunities in metals and mining. Um, and then I would also say, you know, importantly, there are some opportunities for kind of corporate restructuring um, and better, you know, shareholder returns in Japan and now Korea. Um, you know, Japan's been a, a cheap market for a really long time. Um, but more tangibly, in, in really the last kind of 18 months, we've seen companies move to, you know, unwind cross shareholdings. Uh, pay out higher portions of their, you know, their net income to shareholders in the, in the form of dividends and buybacks, um, and generally just kind of improving their understanding of their own cost of capital. Uh, and, and that's produced an environment where we've, you know, found some, 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 some solid investments. Uh, and that seems to be expanding to Korea. So Korea's basically said, you know, we can, we kind of have a similar mm -hmm. setup to Japan. Um, you know, we have a lot of cheap companies with underutilized balance sheets, uh, and if we operate through the exchanges and put more pressure on these companies, uh, it will generally benefit, you know, the, the Korean equity market, uh, which obviously benefits their citizens, citizens um, and, and improves economic wealth. So it's it's really a combination in, in, in multiple markets um, where we're finding kind of different pockets of value, if we will, if you will, just in the sense that um, it's not all the same, but they're great opportunities. OK, you mentioned uh, Japan and Korea. I, you also mentioned China, but what what other countries are you looking at in terms of attractive valuations? Yeah, so we I do like some investments in Canada, and some of that is some of the energy investments there, as well as some of the metals and mining companies. Um, you know, Korea, we we as I mentioned, Korea, we did make a relatively bigger move into uh, earlier this year, um, and that was really because they've just started effectively a corporate reform program. Um, and they're going to really kind of mimic what Japan's doing. Um, and then I, you know, I'd highlight the UK. Um, the UK on its own is, you know, an economy that struggled uh, really kind of since the, the Brexit period. Um, but it's less, uh, you know, I guess what we're expressing in our overweight to UK equities is less about the UK economy specifically, just more about there being really solid valuations in a lot of the companies that are listed here. Uh, and and really, as a result of that, you know, a lot of these companies are big multinationals. Um, so they're, you know, economically speaking, they're no different than companies listed in the U.S. They just happen to be headquartered and listed here. But because capital is generally flown out of the U.K. market, um, the valuations are really attractive. So it's um, and then I would kind of also highlight, you know, we do like some of the financials in Europe. Um, you know, generally, I, the, the fund is a little underweight Europe right now because of opportunities in Japan, Korea, Canada. Um, but within Europe, you know, some of the industrials are still quite attractive. Uh, you know, you have businesses that are as high quality as a lot of U.S. industrials at big discounts to, to where U.S. industrials trade. And then within financials, um, you know, for the first time in my career, I would say European banks have uh, healthier capital levels than U.S. banks. They're just running on excess capital. Um, and, and because of that, their credit positions in, in terms of kind of the credit quality of the banks is quite healthy. You know, higher interest rates has helped their returns. Uh, and as a result of that, the return on equity of the banks has gone up um, and the stock prices have lagged that. And the market's just expressing skepticism that's sustainable. And our general take is uh, it's likely more sustainable than, than at least the market's pricing. Okay. Are there any particular countries or sectors you would be avoiding while investing internationally right now? So generally, as we would say, we <laughs> will we'll tend to look at everything. Um, and if there's an intersection of value, fundamentals, and momentum, we're happy to be there. You know, one of the markets that we have generally not trafficked in a lot is Australia. Um, the banks are quite expensive in Australia. Um, it, you know, one of the, I guess one of the issues that I've kind of noticed with Australia is they have a large, you know, uh, domestic savings pool. Uh, 
Um, and as a result of that, you know, there's there's effectively quotas for it to be invested locally, and it's bid up the prices of a lot of those businesses. So, um, you know, generally speaking, it's it's a component of the you know the EFA market uh, that that on average we've generally been very underweight. Um, and then I would you know I right now not a lot of Scandinavia looks super attractive to us, um, but that's not to say that there that, that they, it couldn't at some point. Um, you know, we have been, you know, China is, we do, we'll kind of go into the emerging markets when we see opportunities. Well, it's primarily a developed market fund. Um, and, and on average, we have also been a little bit lighter in China. Um, China's cheap, but it, it comes with quite a bit of geopolitical risk today. Mm -hmm. and, and this is one, this is probably a question for the ages, but why do U.S. investors stick so close to home when it comes to investing? I mean, we know that U.S. investors just, they just, generally uh, are underweight non-US, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it <clears throat> tends to, you know, generally speaking, it's the market they're comfortable with. And so I think if you look at any country in the world, they tend to be over-indexed to their own country, you know, Australians to Australian market, you know, you go to the Scandinavian markets to their own markets. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, simplistically, the, the US market has been an incredible market. It's been an incredible wealth creator. So you really have to have a good reason to leave it. Um, you know, I, I think that opportunity is today. Uh, and, and, you know, you look at you look at history and, and I like to kind of look at this stuff from a simple sense. You know, some of the best bull markets, so the 1960s, um, the 1990s, they were US led, they were tech led, they were strong dollar cycles. Um, you just wanted to be in the market. And, um, but they kind of got to a point where the multiples expanded well beyond uh, you know, or some of the equity return came from multiple expansion above and beyond earnings growth. Um, and they produced periods of digestion. So eight to 10 year periods where, you know, it, it, the market kind of struggled. That was the 1970s. It was the 2000s. Um, and if in those cycles, if you actually look at them very classically, values tended to do really well. Real assets have tended to do really well and non-US has tended to do well. I think the setup is there today. Um, so I think it's worth having in your portfolio, but I, I do, you know, kind of candidly, every, if you can, if you look at the market post 2008, everyone loved emerging markets. They love commodities. They didn't want the U S market. They didn't want the dollar. They wanted non-correlated returns and you wanted to take the opposite of it um, and buy the U S market and buy the dollar. Um, and now today it's really hard to get investors to kind of peel their hands off U S equities uh, and you kind of have the contrarian setup from my perspective. So I, I, I do think you can kind of look at some of the structural benefits to investing outside the U.S. and then even within that, just kind of periods that are more advantageous than others. Mm -hmm. What about some of the risk of investing internationally that people might want to consider? Yeah, I mean, so I, you know, generally you are taking currency risk. So if you did go through a period of really prolonged dollar strength, that would dilute returns. Um, you know, so that's definitely one risk, you know, we tend to find, I, I guess my take is, you, you know, if you look at big, a lot of big foreign companies, um, I don't think there's sometimes, this is a generalization, they're as shareholder friendly as a lot of big US companies. So oftentimes the better investments aren't necessarily the biggest stocks in the index, which is what you're seeing in the US market. Um, so I do think, Active, you know, active investing has has as a role to play. I think there's plenty of of, of highly represented stocks in terms of their, um, you know, weight in the indexes that are largely value traps from my perspective. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, it it may to, from you know from my perspective, it makes sense to be an active investor. But you know, inherently in active investing, when you're running high active share relative to markets, you know, you are introducing risk. You mentioned value value traps. How how are you able to avoid value traps outside the U.S.? Yeah, and so that's really where that kind of in the context of the three circles, quality and momentum comes into. Um, you know, we are value investors. I, I would generally say, as as we we sit down at our desks, we being you know the analysts and myself, and look for ideas. Uh, it's very easy to find cheap stocks, um, but really, what matters is is the cheap stocks that that will outperform. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're value investors that are sensitive to business momentum. Um, and, and that's really what's helped from a discipline tool. Uh, 
Um, you look over time and there was a long period of time where we generally didn't like European banks because while they were cheap, um, they were, you know, they had kind of compressing margins and they couldn't return capital. That's changed today. They look more attractive, but, you know, from 2010, um, 2011 to 2016, 2017, they largely weren't attractive because they were value traps. You had a lot of that in Japan for a long time. Um, so we've been quite sensitive to just making sure that the companies are, you know, focused on shareholders, that they're returning capital to shareholders. Um, and there's effectively decent underlying, you know, fundamentals and business momentum to make sure we're not getting caught in value traps. All right. Let's talk about geopolitics. It seems like it's a it's a pretty noisy time out there. Maybe one could argue it's always a noisy time, uh, geopolitically speaking. But uh, one thing that I've looked at, I've written a few stories on this, is the the, the seemingly uh, the way that investors seem to separate geopolitics, geopolitical events, uprisings, wars, what have you, with their investing in the markets. And it, it always kind of surprises me. But I mean, like I said earlier, the market, the S&P is up almost 12% this year where, you know, there's, you got at least a couple of major wars going on. You got a presidential election coming up. Well, how do you look at geopolitical events when you're investing? Yeah. So I think that's, you know, I, 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 I guess when I look at it, you know, and as you alluded to, there's always been geopolitical risk. So it's just, and you look at the market over time, it's generally gone up and you wanted to be invested in it. So I, I think the market is relatively intelligent at trying to kind of decipher whether there's a proper profit impact. Um, and so far, you know, there was a profit impact to some degree in 2022 when the Russia war and Ukraine war broke out because energy prices spiked and that negatively impacted, you know, consumer sentiment. And the market responded to that, you know, with higher volatility and higher equity risk premiums. But as the markets digested that that the oil markets are still flowing, you know, oil is still making it out of Russia, you know, corporate profitability is okay. We've seen the market solve for that. And so I think, you know, generally speaking, as we've seen things kind of escalate with, you know, Israel, Iran, um, so far the oil markets have been okay. Um, I guess my take is, you know, it, it's really hard to call. I, I, the one observation I have of the oil markets is that, there is enough oil for the market today to clear, um, but I think there's quite a bit less spare capacity than the market thinks. And, and there's a, a few reasons for that. Um, you know, there's a natural there's a natural tendency for OPEC to overstate their spare capacity. It's what helps set their quotas. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia is one of the biggest holders of spare capacity, also has an incentive to tell the market they have a lot of capacity because it, it actually keeps future oil prices lower. They, they make money selling at spot. Um, and if future prices are lower, it keeps U.S. shale production in check, which helps them. Um, so I, I think there's quite a bit less spare capacity than the market thinks, which um, so to me, the risk and as you highlight, that is if things do kind of escalate in the Middle East and we were to see capacity come offline, um, I think we'd see very high oil prices, much higher than people think. Um, and then at that point, obviously, I think the market would definitely get hit and you'd have to start discounting a recession. So I think mm -hmm. the market, you know, it generally, but it, to some degree, you have to kind of look at those situations um, as opportunities. Uh, historically, you know, eventually the economy's kind of moved on, um, but those those dislocations can certainly create a lot of short-term volatility. Okay. What about the expense of investing internationally in international strategies? Is it something that financial advisors should be prepared for being more expensive? Yeah. So, I mean, the, you know, the fund tends to be a little more expensive than your average ETF. I mean, the way, you know, the way we look at it is, you know, typically we're running 30 to 50 stocks. So they're much more concentrated positions with high active share. Um, so the argument is, is over time, you know, we're targeting uh, a level of, of alpha that's commensurate with higher fees. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at generally the non-U.S. markets, I, I think there's a pretty reasonable argument for for active investing. I mean, I know we we just kind of highlighted it with just generally there being more, uh, you know, value traps. So um, obviously, uh, any prospective investor that 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 would invest in an active ETF could could just buy a passive ETF at lower fees. Um, but when you're doing that, you know, you're getting the index, and if the index is 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 more value traps, then that's something you want to generally avoid. Uh, so I think it's a little different than the U.S. market, where oftentimes you're 
better companies or the bigger ones and they're driving the index and you just want to participate at the lowest fee possible. In the non-US market, you have great investment opportunities, but oftentimes you want to, you know, you want to have high active share. You want to look different than the index. Uh, and again, you know, the hope is that that the alpha generation would be commensurate, commensurate with higher fees. Okay. All right. Let kind of wide open here for the rest of the year. Um, we got a whole six months left. What does uh what does it look like for you? What's your outlook for 2024, Josh? Yeah, so I think it's going to be an interesting year. Uh, I mean, I guess it to some degree it already has been. But my mm -hmm. take is, you know, you go back to late 2022, um, there was quite a bit of, you know, when the market turned down in 20, late, start, it was late 21 through, you know, October of 22, there was quite a bit of liquidity that came out of the market through that period. Um, I am a little bit of a believer that, you know, kind of short-term liquidity dynamics can really impact the market. You know, over time, it's ultimately valuations and profits. Um, but we've been in actually, despite the fact that we've been going through QT and having hot, you know, having seen in real time higher interest rates, the liquidity dynamics of the market kind of globally have been quite positive. Um, and I'm a little concerned that some of that liquidity starts to kind of dry up the summer. Um, so I think there's a reasonable chance, at least from the way I look at things, that you know, more of your kind of better returns have already been had this year. It, it, you know, if there's more to go, I think a lot of it will be seen. By the summer, um, my general take is that because there's some stubbornness in inflation, I think the central banks will start cutting interest rates, but more slowly. Um, and as a result of that, you really won't get enough economic acceleration to see kind of uh, a lot of the significant earnings growth that the market's kind of hoping happens later this year. Um, and then again, you know, as you highlighted, Jeff, we have a big election. Um, I think as probably most investors are. It, it feels like it could be kind of contentious. That could add volatility to the market. <laughs> Um, and so I, you know, I, 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 I actually generally think that things are going to be more difficult and more volatile from a combination of, of just geopolitics, kind of frustrations about economic growth and stubborn inflation, uh, and, and, and maybe a, a little less benign liquidity environment in the back half of this year. Um, I do think that there's some still really good opportunities in the metals market. I've been pretty excited to see, um, you know, just generally copper prices start to reflect the fact that we have, um, you know, some pretty difficult supply and demand dynamics. Um, and then I, you know, I think there's a reasonable argument for, for, for kind of gold, and, um, you know, just as we're seeing large levels of deficits and, and more stubborn stagflation um, that impacts mm -hmm. some of the metals and mining investments. So it's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I ho hopefully it's not, uh, uh, you know, too dour of, a, of an outlook, but I, I think more of the better returns, um, particularly in the U.S. market and tech, I think are kind of coming in the first half of the year. Okay, let me let me go back to a couple of the points you made. There is liquidity drying up during the summer months. Is that a normal pattern? No, so it's quite nuanced, but um, basically. You know, we've gone through some unprecedented kind of maneuvers by central banks in the mm -hmm. QE era. And, uh, you know, one of the things that 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 I've noticed is that um, particularly as it relates to the U.S. banking system um, and what's called the reverse repo facility. Um, this is basically an overnight facility uh, where money market funds can park uh, balances with the Fed mm -hmm. and earn effectively a mi minor discount to Fed funds. Um, and as they this was originally in, intended to really just clear the, the interest rate market. So the T-bill market with Fed funds um, in the period of, of excess reserves. But uh, what happened in 21 when they started raising interest rates was rates went to, you know, five and a half percent. And all of a sudden money market funds can make over 5% lending back to mm -hmm. the Fed. Um, so there was a duration game that was being played. And, you know, at the peak, we saw over $2 trillion being parked at the Fed and money market funds. And that had left largely kind of regional banks um, and it's put, it's created imbalances in the U.S. banking system between smaller regional banks and the big banks. Um, and, and what's happened is just as the Fed has signaled uh, that they're basically done raising rates, a lot of money has come off reverse repo and, and taken some duration on in money market funds. So those balances have gone from $2.3 trillion at their peak down to about $400 billion today. And that effectively, at least from my opinion, acts like QE. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really helped liquidity. And now that you've almost drained that, um, 
I, I think some of that liquidity kind of goes away. So the question is, does this, you know, they could, liquidity would improve if they cut rates substantially, but if they cut rates substantially, you know, you're seeing dollar weakness, you're seeing the commodity markets tighten and respond to it. So it, you just get into a more difficult environment um, where again, a lot of that liquidity that's helped the market um, may be kind of at least slowing in its, its rate of creation um, and creating a, an outcome that's a little bit more volatile. And I think I heard you say you're anticipating a Fed rate cut this year. Is that correct? I do think they'll eventually cut. I think the economy is slowing. But, you know, there's clearly politics at play. I mean, the beginning of this year, we were, you know, they were going to cut 150 bips. And that's, you know, was recently down to, you know, one cut of 50 bips. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, you know, I just generally speaking, I think. It's my opinion, but I think if the labor markets continue to slow, they'll opt for cutting, even though the, the inflation data has been more stubborn. Um, that will steepen the curve, weaken the dollar. Um, and I think, you know, you look at prior precedents and the market tends to rally into the first rate cut. Um, mm -hmm. And then it actually struggles after the first rate cut. And so something like that could be setting up this year. OK, and then finally, you mentioned the presidential election as a potential, I guess, volatility trigger. So that kind of is geopolitics, right? Yeah, I mean, I it, it's a hard one because I think ultimately it will be noise. But mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, assuming it's either Trump or Biden, uh, you know, they, they both want to spend a lot. So to me, one of the, mm -hmm. the most important things that's underpinning this inflationary dynamic that's creating stubbornness in the rate structure is, is, is large deficits. And it, it was, to me, the big thing that changed post the pandemic was that we had not seen inflation um, from the GFC period to the pandemic. And, and that was because all the QE, you know, all the money that was created through QE sat in the banking system. It didn't really go into the real economy. Mm -hmm. um, there was no broad based, you know, money supply growth or, or money multiplier effect. And, you know, post pandemic, we got QE and we got massive fiscal deficits. And to me, that more directly put the money in the real economy. Um, so it's the persistence of fiscal deficits, I think, creates some, I think it's creating some of these stagflationary issues, at least from my perspective, both, mm -hmm. both uh, Biden and Trump seem to be interested in spending a lot. Um so, I, you know, I, I, I don't think that dynamic would change. Um, Josh, what are you seeing in the commodity markets? Yeah, so I think there's a couple really interesting things to look at in the commodity markets. And I alluded to it earlier, but um, it's just kind of been important to understand the trends. Um, because the, the experience for a lot of investors over the last 10 years has been, you know, rather unpleasant investing in, you know, commodity related equities. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the simple things you can look at uh, in, 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 in what are kind of capital intensive industries that are highly cyclical, like um, oil and gas and like metals and mining, um, is just the ratio at which these companies are investing in their asset bases. Um, so one of the things that we will look at is the rate at which, um, you know, their capital spending is relative to their rate of depreciation. And the rate of depreciation uh, reflects their current, you know, the, de the, de the current depreciation rate of of what they've already invested in. Um, and so simplistically, if they're investing at a much higher rate than they're depreciating their current asset base, that they're growing their, their investments. Um, and, and the rule of thumb in the energy industry is that when it's over two times CapEx to depreciation, uh, it, it tends to be a, you know, a precursor to a lot more supply coming on. Mm -hmm. um, and so typically what's happened and, and also why the industry has a bad reputation is when there's tightness in supply and demand, prices go up, you know, the return on equity of these businesses goes up um, and then they buy into the cycle and they start spending. Um, and instead, we're seeing a pretty unique situation and, and you can track this data, you know, over the last kind of 20 or 30 years and, and, and even further, really. Um, and, and that's been a pretty tight relationship. Again, when, they're, when their returns have gone up, they've started spending, uh, but that's not happening today. So the returns of a lot of these businesses have gone up but the capital spending is really constrained. And, and I think there's two reasons for that. One is, um, you know, they had gone through a period of poor returns. So shareholders are putting pressure on the management teams to not spend um, mm -hmm. and return more capital to shareholders, which is good from the standpoint of shareholders. Um, and then the second is that they've been told that their asset bases are stranded um, because of, you know, kind of EVs and electrification, that there, there'll be a negative impact on demand. Uh, and so they're not reinvesting. 
Um, all that does is basically means the supply markets are just tighter. Um, and it, it, it should mean that future returns and opportunities in the stocks are really good. Um, so if you look at that, you say, OK, well, what if we still want to say that electrification is powerful and demand is, is quite poor? Um, you know, one of the things that we're looking at in the copper markets um, is just some simple estimates of basically supply and demand. Um, and I know, uh, you know, IHS, which is a kind of a global consultancy, had put out some forecasts in 2022. Um, and, 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 and their forecast basically said, look, there's about 30 million tons of copper uh, to, you know, supply and demand, demand in, 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 right now. And that's expected you know, to grow by potentially 40 to 50 percent through 2035, just on general electrification trends. Um, and they expected that market to be in kind of 10 to 20 percent deficits at that point. Um, uh, and, and really, they, they define that as kind of a bad outcome, but you'd still be heavily undersupplied. Um, and the reality is, if you're kind of 10 to 20 percent undersupplied in a market that's grown 50 percent on 30 million tons, you know, you're still probably having to add about 12 million tons per year to the supply of the copper markets. Um, and if you look at the data, that means we need to add uh, at least 25 of the world's largest mines over the next 10 years. And it really, you can't do it because, you know, most of these deposits, we there's only a good four or five of them um, that are really of that scale. Uh, most of them haven't been green lighted. Um, they're in regions like Peru and Chile where it's hard to access labor and water. Um, so it, it, when you when you kind of dig into it, it just becomes obvious that it's going to be very hard to grow or electrify the economy at the rate uh, that that a lot of, of, of market forecasters are, are hoping. Um, so it, you know, it, it, the way we're thinking about it is it generally means that some opportunities in the copper markets are, are excellent and we'll probably see substantially higher copper prices both to incentivize more supply and slow demand. Um, but it also means that, you know, if we electrify the economy more slowly than, than hoped, uh, you know, that may mean that oil prices are higher for longer um, and that creates good opportunities in the energy market. So that's really kind of how we're thinking about it when you bring the two together. Okay. We talked a little bit about Fed policy and your outlook for that, but uh, not the inverted yield curve. What is your perspective on that? How much longer can this go on? Yeah, there's a couple interesting things, and I, I don't know exactly when it will end, but my observations of when curves, yield curves are inverted, um, it, you know, has historically been an indicator that the economy is slowing, and most of the time it goes into recession. Now, I, you know, there's huge levels of fiscal spending, so I, I don't know if we go into a recession or not. My guess is it'll be a very shallow one if we do, um, and we may avoid one. Um, but what typically happens when the curve's inverted is because of that behavior, because it typically implies the economy's slowing, that the market often focuses on, you know, mega cap stocks. So there tends to be a cap bias to the performance of the market. And we've basically seen that. So even, you know, even as value has been working in the non-US markets, we've seen a huge differential in the performance of, um, you know, generally some of the larger mega cap value stocks versus the smaller and mid cap ones. So I, I think the first thing that could happen is on the assumption that at some point the yield curve uninverts um, is you get better breadth in the markets. And I think that's the U.S. and non-U.S. markets. So you'll see just kind of more participation. I think that will generally be better for active managers. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second, you know, it, it kind of is, is something along similar lines. You know, I, you know, there are some analogies to the 2000 cycle. I, you know, it's by far not perfect. Um, you know, but back then uh, you had a bit of a bubble. Um, inequities and uh, in, and what happened was when the Fed started raising rates, you know, high multiple stocks sold off, and then they the Fed indicated that they were done raising rates, um, and the market rallied. But a lot of the lower quality growth stuff um, was largely kind of never rallied again. It was a much more concentrated version of effectively the higher quality stuff, so like Cisco back then, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that rallied into the first rate cut. And then once the they started cutting and the curve started on inverting. Um, you had much better participation actually from real assets and, and a lot of the, kind of the value parts in the market. And, and I actually think we could have something similar. Um, you know, we're seeing a, a scenario where, you know, they started to tighten, uh, you know, interest rates and money supply in late 2001 uh, into 2000, you know, 2022 um, growth sold off. 
Um, and then since they've signaled that they're done, the market's been rallying, but it's been a pretty concentrated rally. Um, and my general sense is that rally can continue into the first rate cut. Um, but once the curve uninverts, I think you'll see better participation from, you know, a lot of parts of the market that, that I think are off investors' radars, like the materials and the energy markets. Um, and it, you know, we're also hopeful that the non-U.S. markets are, are better too, as it, it likely um, signals a period that's, you know, more weakness for the dollar. Okay. Consumer spending. Uh, we know they represent about 70% of the economy. Can the consumer continue to show up here? Yeah, I mean, there's clearly kind of cracks under the surface. Um, you know, the the lower end consumer, it looks like they're really kind of struggling with, um, you know, with inflation. You know, I, I one of the interesting things that we've seen is because just because of some of the dynamics in the U.S. market, the the, the, the U.S. consumer has been less rate sensitive. Um, but I think now the market, because the market first worried about rates and its impact on the consumer, and now the market doesn't seem worried about it. But my concern would be that, it, that, that there's still a negative impact is just more slow to show up. Um, so, I, you know, generally speaking, what happens is the Fed uh, tends to start cutting when the, you know, when things really slow down, which would mean the consumer is really slowing. And if the consumer really doesn't slow here, we're going to see higher rates for longer. So something has to give. Um, I would generally say it's not a great time in the cycle to be really um, positive on the consumer. Um, so, you know, you, things tend to usually get worse before they get better. Um, you know, the one pocket where you have maybe some interesting consumer dynamics is, I, it sounds a bit contrarian, but I think Europe and Japan could be a little better. Um, European consumers saw much more uh, immediate impact from higher rates. The transmission mechanisms are faster in those markets. They're, they don't have a fixed rate mortgage market for the most part. Um, so as rates went up, you know, consumers uh, saw the impact of it more rapidly. Um, and they saw a lot, uh, they were much more acutely impacted by the, you know, the energy issues in those markets when the Russia-Ukraine war broke out. So as energy prices have come down, that's providing consumers re with relief. And counterintuitively, if you, you get some central bank cuts in rates, that will more directly help those consumers, um, you know, where you really haven't seen U.S. consumers slow down. So it's a, it's a relative impact. Um, and then Japan, you know, Japan's been a market that's had kind of a high savings rate, um, a low level of kind of consumption growth for a really long time. Um, but they're seeing wage growth for the first time in, in a long time. Um, and that sets up an environment where, um, you know, you could just see a, a, a healthier Japanese consumer. Yeah, she talked earlier about uh, the attractiveness of some European banks. Can you can you give us a little more detail on that? Yeah, so I, I think what we've seen is, you know, just going back to the post GFC period, um, you know, at, at, originally the market said this was a U.S. problem and European banks were kind of fine. And, you know, what we experienced in 2011 or 2012 was that they had a, made a lot of bad loans. They had overstretched their balance sheets. Um, and so the regulators kind of leaned into this period where the where the European banks, just broadly speaking, had to clean up their balance sheets. And I you know, when you compare them with the U.S. banks, the U.S. banks recapitalize their balance sheets much more rapidly, which just put them in a position to lend, you know, grow loans, you know, pay, pay, pay dividends, pay shareholders. Um, so it really made the U.S. banks healthier earlier. So um, and, and, and instead, European banks were basically going through this long period of retaining capital to rebuild their balance sheets and slowly realize uh, credit losses. Um, that created a situation where for a long period of time, they were basically value traps. Um, but what's happened today is because of a long period of the regulators really leaning into them and saying you need to hold more capital, um, the system actually looks quite healthy today. So you look at you know levels of regulatory capital on the European banks. A lot of them are a lot of banks are 14, 15, 16 percent what is called CET1. So it's the ratio of capital to their assets. You know U.S. banks are 10, 11. So a lot of these banks are 40 to 50 percent overcapitalized relative to U.S. banks. The regulators force them to kind of swap out a lot of their duration mismatches. So you haven't seen the duration issues that some of the U.S. regional banks have had. Um, and, and, and largely because the banks have been under so much pressure for a long time, they haven't really been growing their loans, which in a simple sense means they haven't been making a lot of bad uh, credit you know, decisions. And, you know, you look at most banking crises, one of the, 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 the best indicators leading up to them is just a rapid rate of you know, loan growth. 
Um, so if they're, if generally speaking, they've been very subdued in issuing new loans, um, it means the credit profile of these banks is better. You know, generally, I know a lot of investors have talked about the commercial real estate market. Our take is that more of the commercial real estate issues um, are in the U.S. market. You know, there'll, there'll be pockets of them in the European market, but generally it looks a little bit better. Um, so when you look at those the banks in Europe, they're at really low levels of you know valuation vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. banks. Their capital levels um, are very high. So when you look at the returns on equity, they lag U.S. banks by a little bit. But when you adjust for the capital, they're pretty similar. Um, and we have you know banks that are uh, basically said because you know we have low levels of demand for new loans, we'll just return our excess capital to shareholders. And you see combinations of buybacks and dividends that go into the teens. So it, it sets up an environment where, again, for the first time in my career, I, I, I really think the European banks look like better investments than U.S. banks. Um, mm. you know, that's not to say that if we go into a recession, they, they wouldn't pull back. Um, but I think they're quite healthy today um, in, in terms of just generating better returns, having healthier balance sheets uh, and a trading at you know attractive valuation levels. Did, did you say that the commercial real estate market looks worse in the U.S. than Europe? And, and if so, I'd like to know why that is. I the, it a the lot same of the, thing that I thought the same impact was was kind of global, basically. A lot, a lot of commercial. It's just defined because really, when you talk about commercial real estate, you have to talk about the office mm -hmm. market. Yeah. And the European, there's just less kind of it's more the two tier two, tier three real estate mm -hmm. market. And you just you have less of a of of that's just it's less present in Europe. A lot of more commercials kind of mixed commercial with, you know, real estate and resident, you know, with 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 retail and mm -hmm. residential. So you just don't have the level of kind of um, and, and I would also say just the lending practices were a little bit more subdued in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. So just generally what we're seeing and it's you know, we we, we see a lot of the, 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 the management teams of a lot of the banks and they have exposure both on the Europe and the US side. And, and they're kind of echoing the same thing. They're saying generally um, they're more worried about stresses in kind of that, the, the, the tier two, tier three US market than they, they are in, in their commercial real estate portfolios in, in Europe. Thanks a lot. I hope everyone enjoyed it. On behalf of Matt Hammer, Josh Jones, and Paul Heathwood, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's webinar.